ever going to do. I started at about the age of one and a half or two, advertising the free orange juice <laughs> that every child got in the post office after the war. Yeah. Um, the reason being that my, my grandparents were photographers, professional photographers. So apart from my mother having been an old teeny, um, and my brother and older cousin were Heinz Bay theme boys, uh, it's my grandparents who are to blame for Sir Roger Moore's knitting pattern. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> we, we have apologised and did apologise to him copious times, but I don't think he ever forgave us, to be true. <laughs> uh, I got into modelling quite early, almost by accident, um, and then very luckily I seemed to fit and did a lot of covers of magazines like Vogue and Harper's and things. And there I met some good and some bad. Glorious photographer Norman Parkinson, who, when we had one shoot uh, where it was for Vogue Brides and it was the sort of negligee that you would take on honeymoon with you, so we were draped over rocks in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Norman, bless his heart, stood in the water saying, When I'm told to carry on, we'll all get out. <laughs> David Bailey, however, <laughs> actually succeeded in making me cry. He was so vile. But I do have to say the photograph that he did of me with a tear coming down my cheek and it was then emphasised looked smashy. <laughs> so although he was not a nice man, that was very close, <laughs> not a nice man, <laughs> he, he did do some good photographs. Now what about some ladies? Well, when colour television was coming over here. America had it first, and we had to do some plays for television in black and white and in colour. And so the cameras were piggybacked. The American colour camera was on top of our black and white English camera, which meant that when we saw it in England, everybody had a huge amount of space above because it was all slightly wrong. But I was colour standing, as it's called, um, because all the cameras had to be twiddled and made to look the same colour. And apparently blondes, um, and I was definitely ash blonde, with blue eyes and sort of yellowish skin, were the most difficult to do. So I was employed quite a lot. And I was standing for a lady called Ingrid Bergman. Oh. And I would, whenever... I wasn't needed, I'd be leaning against the walls sort of keeping out of everybody's way. And I felt somebody pushing me at the back, and she said, I won't do her accent because it's impossible, oh, don't look, but I'm going to go and talk to the director and my husband, and you must come and ask me if I want tea or coffee from the trolley. And she was gone, and I thought she could have told me now. I mean, she was standing just there. Mm -hmm. But, no, off she went. And I went to her and said, you know, excuse me, excuse me, Miss Bergman, would you like tea or coffee? Oh, you kind person. Thank you so much. If she hadn't done that, I would have been fired. That was part of my job, but nobody had told me. Uh. <laughs> but Miss Bergman knew. Ava Gardner I did a film with, and... Maddie is here as well. We, again, that was Scott Green. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> um, and she was quite a miracle. She'd come in in the morning looking, I'm not being on time, but fairly drastic. I mean, there were puffy eyes. She, she had you know, sort of a saggy jaw and everything. And she'd go into makeup, and just from the force of herself, just muscle power and... Oh. Makeup. No, not makeup. Oh. Not makeup. It was the lady herself. She just pulled herself together and she was magnificent. Oh. And then we get to Joan Collins. <laughs> <laughs> I had a scene with her um, in a television play and we were both sat on the sofa and I had this long bit to say to her and she sat back on the sofa. So, of course, I talked to her there. <laughs> cut, cut. And I thought, got the words right, I'm sure I did. And the director came up and took me to one side and he said, if she does that again, 
just look above the camera and say the same lines, but look as though you're thinking about the line. She'll sit forward. She <laughs> <laughs> I carried on with my modelling and did a commercial for ice cream. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which was shown in the cinemas. Uh, which sort of was me sambering towards the camera and ending up with a cherry on the end of my nose, as much as I can remember. Uh, but it did lead to a film contract with Harry Saltzman. So never give up. Never get Weird things can happen in this business. <laughs> um, Harry Saltzman was the one for whom I, I signed the contract, not to cover broccoli, uh, because Harry had this idea that he wanted to start, like the rank charm school, his own sort of charm school, so he started with a blonde female and a blonde male. And nobody knows what happened to Michael Caine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a difficult time. Um, Harry was lovely to me. Some people found it difficult, but to me he was lovely. Except he had this power office. And you'd go into his office and it was all black leather. And they were big, deep black leather sofas. So that if you sat back, your feet stuck out like a four-year-old. So you had to sit on the edge. And his desk was on a dais above you. So you knew who was power boss. But I had the contract offered, and I thought that it was somewhat one-sided. I didn't realize that contracts were always one-sided. So I tinkered with it a bit and said that I didn't want to do any nude or semi-nude scenes unless I deemed it necessary. <laughs> Good phrase. Vanessa Redgrave, Glenda Jackson, Helen Mirren, etc. were throwing off clothes like autumn leaves. <laughs> and for some reason, I, I thought that I was posh enough not to do it and to say so to the powers that be. So I got asked to do a little part, very little part, in a James Bond film, uh, for which I had to wear a red wig because there were too many blondes. Um, and it was just a sort of tester. But then I was let out to do Scars of Dracula, which, again, I refused to take my clothes off, although quite a few other ladies did. It gets hot in studios, you know. <laughs> um, and then I did a dreadful film called The Flesh and Blood Show. You'd have thought there was a clue in the name, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, other girls were taking their clothes off. I refused to, so the director <coughs> eventually cut in another lady's top and bottom. Well, it wasn't the bottom, but no yeah. one going with this. Um, and I didn't like it, so I complained to Equity, who were on my side, and we took him... <laughs> Equity was good then. We took him, or were going to take him to court, uh, because these were enormous boobs. And very black pews. <laughs> so, Equity said that it was defamation of character because I was a natural blonde. <laughs> because I was a natural blonde. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we got almost as far as, as the courtroom or the yeah, door, and um, he backed out and decided to cut out the bottom bit, but these enormous bosoms were there. <laughs> At Pinewood, I worked, we're back to uh, ladies, I worked on Shirley's World, which was a series produced over here um, for Shirley MacLaine and um, John Gregson. Um, but Shirley had uh, script approval, and if she didn't like the script, she would black the studio. We'd all have to come in and sit doing nothing while she decided that the script was all right. And my part got cut down to about two or three pages was something that she did to practically every girl on that series. So uh, if you ever come across Shirley's World, it'll be Shirley, but not a lot of other females. Uh, but I was also doing The Persuaders with uh, Tony Curtis and Roger Moore. When we all had lunch at that time in the restaurant at Pineland, mm -hmm. which is a lovely restaurant, and we'd all be there in our various outfits that we were used uh, were used for the programs we were doing. And this man came up to me and said um, he would very much appreciate it if I would go and see Billy Wilder when I'd finished filming. And I thought, <laughs> don't be silly. Number one, he's American and he's not over here that I know about. 
um, you want me to go to a room after filming and I'll be in a difficult situation. So I said no. I went back to kissing Roger Moore. <laughs> <laughs> About three weeks later, my agent rang me and said, Billy Wilder has cast you in his film, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, and you don't need to go for an audition, and you don't need to uh, do anything except just turn up. Wait a minute, should I learn from this that saying no is good? <laughs> but it did lead to, uh, the filming was lovely, but it, it led to going to America because a magazine that had been successful called Show Magazine owned and run by a reprobate called Huntingdon Hartford, um, had relaunched Show Magazine. And because it was a Billy Wilder film, and because I was now his new Jew of lead, um, I was on the front and had a big spread inside. So I went to New York, did all the interviews and, and television and radio and everything, and then went to uh, Hollywood and did things there, and went to parties, and met two of my absolute heroes at one of these parties. And that was Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. Loved me till I stood up. And then I felt like a giant. <laughs> they were perfectly formed, but not very tall. No. <laughs> and then John Voigt walked into the room. Six foot four. Hooray for Hollywood. <laughs> I was taken to the MGM studios, as everybody should. Because from there, you can be in the parking lot. You can be photographed with the Hollywood sign behind you. And the man who was looking after me was taking the photographs. When a whole lot of people got out of a, a traveler's coach, well, no, tourist coach, and saw me and ran up to me and said, Gee, Faye Dunaway, wow, how great to see you. Because Bonnie and Clyde had been out fairly recently. And the man with me said, Just son, or we'll never get out of here. I did. I'm awfully glad to say that I can't be sued because both names I spelt wrong. Not that I knew it then, but I was fade on the way. We went back to New York. I did the Dick Cavett show, which was the nighttime television show to be on. And they asked me to go and see it the night before I was due to be on. And on there was Alfred Lutz and Lynn Fontaine and no coward. I mean, what a threesome to have on your sofa. They were wonderful, they were brilliant. No coward I'd met before uh, at home in my flat with my mother. And he had arrived early. And I didn't understand this phrase at the front door. He said that he was very sorry to arrive early, but his wife was ill and his other wife was looking after him. <laughs> well, that's a good conundrum to work on. But we had to have a chat, because Mother wasn't ready, Jack wasn't ready, and we got round to talking about Kipling, for some reason. And I went and got my book of Just So Stories, and I sat on the floor as he read to me The Butterfly That Stamped and How the Elephant Got His Nose. Just magical. And there in New York, I was very unhappy because my father had died just a few months before. And the master saw this. He loved women. And he immediately said, I must take her to my dressing room. And it was like the parting of the Red Sea. And I went to his dressing room, bawled my heart out for about five minutes. And about two minutes later, a makeup lady and a hairdresser arrived at his door. And he booked them. He knew I was going to cry, knew that I needed to, and he'd arranged it. Oh. A very special, very wonderful man. Oh. I then went and did the show, got back to my hotel room, and there was Warren Beatty. Oh. Oh. In my hotel room. <coughs> I hadn't ordered him. <laughs> <laughs> what I had ordered was my usual vodka and tonic and some carrot batons. He'd eaten them. <laughs> there was no way to make your way to a lady's home. <laughs> he had also, he informed me, cancelled my uh, plane ticket for the next day to go back to England. 
Oh. Mm -hmm. He said, after I'd spent the night with him, I wouldn't want to leave. So he left, because I called security. <laughs> and he was thrown out of my room. After that, I settled down back to my career in England and was asked to go for the possibility of a commercial to a street in Chelsea, not very posh street in Chelsea, and up at the top of the metal stairs was this big door. Knocked, opened it, and there was this rather large fat man who ushered me in and sat behind a desk and showed me the seat and said, I'm Orson Welles. Oh. And I thought, I'm Faye Dunaway. <laughs> I thought, two from Faye this game. So we had a lovely conversation, and it was all going terribly well, and we said our goodbyes, and he let me out through another door, and it was baronial stairs going down with all these huge portraits of Orson Welles mm -hmm. in all his best, best films and things. I didn't get that commercial, which is no surprise, but I did, however, later on do an episode of Orson Welles' Great Mysteries, so it was worth, it was worth doing. He remembered mm -hmm. me. I did Softly Softly for about six years and can tell you that scary actors, most likely are gigglers, don't trust them. <laughs> and then came Magpie and the royal family again came uh, well, into my life. My grandparents were by appointment to the Queen Mother and the Queen and they were the first photographers to do happy family snaps of the royal family before uh, the king became king and before Princess Elizabeth was threatened with being queen. Um, the queen uh, at a big party in Hyde Park was due to come and see the children's television tent. So I was saying to all the children, just wait, she'll be here in a minute. Somebody sneezed, so I took a tissue from my pocket and put it behind me and said, you know, some tight. And this male laugh happened. And Prince Philip said, it's the first time she's been told that for years. <laughs> and there was I with a tissue just sort of waiting for the Queen to take it, as if she would. <laughs> Prince Philip flew me um, in one of his flights. I've never seen a co-pilot so scared in all my life. But apparently Prince Philip always demanded to fly. Prince Charles demanded, um, what's it called? Slow gin to be put in his car when we finished filming. Princess Anne, I had my children with me, my one son, three-year-old, hyperactive, my other son, breastfeeding, not a good look. Um, and they needed me, so I had to go off to the loo, came back just in time for the line, and Princess Anne took one look at me with these two kids and said, why, oh, children? <laughs> <laughs> and moved on. <laughs> Prince Andrew, uh, and a, a German magazine, said I was having an affair with was news to both me and Prince Andrew. <laughs> uh, at Magpie also, I met Al Arnold Schwarzenegger when he first was, was he Mr. World or something? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Universe. 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 Mr. Universe, good Lord. Yeah. But the one I fell in love with was David Soul. Oh, tall and blonde and tanned and wearing all white. I mean, I loved Mick Robertson, but this was different. <laughs> this was totally different. Then I think Magpie tried to kill me because they wanted the girl to do everything and more that John Noakes did. So I did the rock climbing and I did the underwater helicopter escape training and I did the parachute jump, solo parachute jumping with the Red Devils. And I think I was the first female um, side gunner on a frigate during a NATO exercise. That was good. Um, and then I was the first female to go down a steam coal mine. Um, that was the reason they didn't let women down coal mines is very sensible, because the men might stand back just to let a woman go first, and in that nanosecond, somebody else would be killed. So it makes sense to be truthful, but there's no point in sending me down there. Very unfair. I worked for the children's page, or did my own page in the Daily Mirror for a few years, and met. Um, Robert Maxwell. Yeah, everybody breathe in. He was charming to me. He was absolutely lovely. And we talked about cooking and things like that. It's uh, 
It's how you meet people and where you meet people and how you give yourself to people, I think. The two Ronnies are exactly how you would expect them. Morecambe and Wise were just more so. I did a, a Christmas Morecambe and Wise and with Leonard Rossiter. And <laughs> Eric Morecambe, when he saw us queuing up in the cafe at the studios and they were going to the private dining room, said, we're getting paid more than you, come to the private dining room. And that was very Eric Walker. People who, who don't get stories because they're being good, the stories that are printed because the press like it more, are the scandalous ones or the unhappy ones. If you ask me what my favourite person not to interview again, although it's not possible because sadly he's no longer with us, it would be Spike Milligan. Because... <laughs> You can't count on him to do anything that you've asked him to do. And on Saturday night at the mill, uh, he was meant to just simply walk onto the set and sit down. No, he'd found a ladder. So he went up the back of the flat, and when I said, Spike Milligan, he went, ooh, from up there, and started to do the whole interview with me sat down here. He went up, he went up there. You can't make people do what, what they don't want to do. Like, for instance, there was an escapologist on that show who couldn't. And just... <laughs> <laughs> My favourite interview for radio, which I've been doing for the last few years, is Jerry Lewis. Again, a man that everybody says, mm, don't work with him, he's trouble. He was charming. He had a lovely time. Instead of doing uh, just what was meant to be a 10-minute interview, he stayed with us for nearly 50 minutes, and that was 35 minutes of edited interview that we could do. And the next day, he sent a bunch of flowers and a thank you letter. Now, that's from a big man like Jerry Lewis, so there are super people out there. And it's at gatherings like this that we can meet them, that we can share ideas we can help the young along, tell them some of the pitfalls, as well as some of the glories and the fun that we can have. So, as I say, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Uh, Gareth will give you updates on the lunch. Lunches. Lunches. Um, and unless, well, let me just put it this way. I have been warned um, that, well, Gareth said there was a problem in the kitchens and that they might need some extra people to do some washing up. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you've got some questions, I've got something to do. <laughs> Dessert will be coming out now and coffee and yes, tea. I'm just going um, to... Uh, we'll be here for a while. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I know, and they usually lock the door. Uh, but there is a lift. Oh, wow. I'll try. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>